Greetings. Welcome to This, That, and the Other, where I react to, respond to, comment on, question, or otherwise propound on whatever I find of interest on any given day. Now, today's topic Thrice upon a time, in 2001, 2, and 3, I sat, like tens of millions of others, in a movie theater with my eyes bugged out and my jaw dropped. Someone was actually able to take one of the most complicated fantasy stories ever written and translate it onto a movie screen and made it all seem so real words like stunning, awesome, fantastic, incredible, just didn't feel adequate. Now, by the time the movies had arrived, I had read the books many times, and I continue to do so. And I've seen the movies multiple times as well. There's no such thing as too much Middle Earth. Now, a few months ago, I started watching reaction videos. At first, they annoyed me. I couldn't believe anybody could be so stupid. Then I had a couple of revelations. First, I hadn't grasped the concept of first-time viewing. Since that soaked in, the reaction started being not so stupid. Then I realized that most all of the reactors, at least of the Fellowship of the Ring, we're watching the theatrical version, which is a big waste of time. I'm glad the comments on those reactions were in total agreement. Watch the extended edition. Once they did that, the reactions became even less stupid. They still had problems, though. The main problem is that most of the reactors are millennials. Now, not that there's anything intrinsically wrong with that, but they're just too darn young to have been exposed to any of the Tolkien universe. And they don't pay attention to what the films are saying because they're too busy talking and asking questions to thin air. So I set out to produce a series of videos to provide background information. Now, it became obvious that much of the confusion of the reactors came from not having been given adequate explanations of what had gone before. And whose fault is that, Mr. Jackson? So I tried to fill in the gaps. And I found this required viewing the movies and reading the books more or less simultaneously. And as I progressed, it started becoming clear that the further I delved into Tolkien's world, the further Jackson was straying from it. Peter Jackson was merely using Tolkien's work as a framework for writing his own epic, as opposed to actually filming the original story. Uh, by way of a rather dumb analogy to Jackson's adaptation, imagine the end of King Kong. The original has a giant ape on top of the Empire State Building being shot at by World War I-era biplanes, falls to his death on the street below. Right? Now, if Peter Jackson got hold of it, the ape would be shot by Spitfires and Mustangs from World War II and fall to his death on the streets below in Chicago. That's the level of accuracy in Jackson's adaptation. We're now well into the Return of the King except for two chapters still left over from the Two Towers that won't be dealt with for another hour yet. I am having serious problems finding scenes in the movie that were actually in the book, and vice versa, and in the same sequence. 
And you want to know the most annoying and frustrating thing of all? That this man, despite all his arrogance and ego and, well, vandalism, has still managed to create the most magnificent cinematic masterpiece since Casablanca. My mantra has become, the book is truth. The movie is a fictionalized revision. If you could accept that, the movie's incredible. If, like me, you can't. The movie's merely very good, but it just isn't really Tolkien's story. <sighs> okay, so Mozart on the stereo, a nice cup of chamomile tea, some deep breathing exercises, and I'll be ready to dive back in. And thanks for understanding my need to rant. Now, let's sum up again. It's March 10th, and we're five days away from the Battle of the Pelennor. Frodo, Sam, and Gollum are reaching the top of the Kirith Ungle stairs, just before entering the tunnel. Gandalf and Pippin are still in Minas Tirith, and will be for the duration. Theoden and the Rohirrim, along with Merry, are at Dunharrow, preparing for the long ride to Minas Tirith. Faramir has uh, brought his company down from North Ithilien to reinforce the garrison at Asgiliath. Aragorn, Legolas, Gimli, the Grey Company, and their unseen companions have passed the Paths of the Dead and are south of the White Mountains, heading towards Pilagar. While Aragorn's supernatural subterranean activity was going on, the Rohirrim were preparing to ride to Gondor. But exactly what happens and where depends on who you listen to. After the Saruman episode, the book has Theoden and his retinue, accompanied by Gandalf, Aragorn, and their company, heading back towards Helm's Deep. They camp for the night in an unspecified location somewhere in the Westfold, around the Gap of Rohan. Now, this is where Pippin looked in the Pilanter causing Gandalf to whisk him away to Minas Tirith. The next day, they were overtaken by the Dúnedain, Aragorn's kinsmen from the north. The now enlarged company continued on to Helm's Deep. See the last half of episode 14 uh, for the full story, including Aragorn's departure. From Helm's Deep, Theoden calls for the marshalling of the Rohirrim. Messengers ride out to all regions of the kingdom, gathering the riders to Dunharrow. Aragorn uses the Palantir and wrests control of it from Sauron. From what he saw and the messages brought by the Dúnedain, he decided to set off immediately. Accompanied by the ever-faithful Legolas and Gimli, and Halberad and the Dunedain, they set off for Dunharrow, stopping only for a brief rest at Edoras, and then the Paths of the Dead. Logistics required the Rohirrim to follow more slowly a few days later. The movie, however, has them all going directly to Edoras, and Pippin does his bit there. He leaves with Gandalf, the rest wait around for a few days until Pippin lights the beacon so the Rohirrim can spring into action. Theoden arrives at Dunharrow, as do riders from all over Rohan. They get themselves organized and start on the long road to Gondor. Mary is fascinated by the place, especially the Pukul men ancient stone statues along the trail up the hillside to the encampment. Quote, huge and clumsy-limbed, squatting cross-legged with their stumpy arms folded on fat bellies, unquote. They were placed at each uh, switchback on the zigzag trail up the mountainside. 
I don't like getting sidetracked here, but kind of have to. Now, there is so much wrong with this sequence that I really don't know where to start. For at least the 20th time, none of these dream or vision sequences exist in the book. They are all just Jackson's hallucinations. Elrond never, ever left Rivendell during the war. The Dunedain brought similar messages from Elrond and Arwen in the excised The Passing of the Grey Company chapter. And Aragorn already had the sword, as I keep reminding you. The war lies to the east. You cannot the parting the conversation between Aragorn and Eowyn about doing great deeds without glory and all that was relocated to Helm's Deep just before the Battle of the Hornburg replaced here with this soap opera nonsense. Now we can get back to the main narrative. Theoden is greeted by Eowyn, who sadly reports that Aragorn and friends have been there, but she could not dissuade them from taking the paths of the dead. Mary was given a small tent beside the king's pavilion, where he spent much of his time while war plans were being made. He was called to wait upon the king during dinner, and then Theoden invited him to be seated. He asked about the paths, and Theoden and Eomer reluctantly uh, told him the story in the book. In the movie, Legolas tells Gimli the story as they begin traveling the paths. But at least the viewer is informed for a change. Then an errand rider from Gondor arrived, bearing the Red Arrow, an ancient war token used by Gondor and Rohan to request aid. Discussion ensued as to how much force could be sent and how quickly. Hergon, the rider, spent the night, witnessed the muster in the morning, and left to bring these tidings to Denethor. In the morning, the king refused Mary's desire to go to war. Little hobbits do not belong in war, Master Meriadoc. All my friends have gone to battle. I would be ashamed to be left behind. It is a three-day gallop to Minas Tirith, and none of my riders can bear you as a burden. I want to fight. I will say no more. But, quote, a young man, less in height and girth than most, Unquote, came up to Mary and offered to smuggle him out. And off they went. Ride with me, my lady. Despite the fact that the beacons were already lit, it must be stated for the gazillionth time, New Zealand undoubtedly is one of the most incredibly beautiful places on earth. Or you can save two grand and just go to Colorado. Now remember, Aragorn isn't there. The beacons are finished, it? The beacons are lit! For Actually, neither is Theoden. They didn't go to Edoras, remember? Well? Well? And Rohan will answer. Master the Rohirrim. Yay! Isn't that the same alarm bell they used on Odo Island in Godzilla? Things are getting stressful in Minas Tirith. Pippin is appointed Denethor's esquire, at least until his talents are discovered and he can be assigned appropriate duties. Denethor and Gandalf discuss what's what in Rohan. Pippin is sent to the armory to get 
kitted out. I imagine this is just There's a no mention of his livery formerly belonging to Faramir. They don't actually expect Besides, to do Faramir has not yet returned to the city from Asgiliath. In the evening, Pippin and Baragond again stroll the city walls. Tolkien mentions the sunset, quote, even as Frodo saw it at the crossroads, touching the head of the fallen king, unquote. Now, here's a point where we can sync up our timelines. I don't want to be in a battle. But waiting on the edge of one I can't escape is even worse. Pippin already did say something like this, but to someone else at a different time in a different place. Is there any hope, Gandalf, for Frodo and Sam? There never was much hope. Just a fool's hope. Pippin and Gandalf have this exchange at a different time in a different place. All in all, another amalgamation of phrases and sentences from uh, all over the chapter, kind of smooshed together, joined by a lot of Jackson's inventions. Peter, balcony scenes are best left to Shakespeare. Suddenly, Nazgul appears, apparently attacking something on the ground. Then Pippin saw what? A small group of men riding towards the city. A horn call went up. Baragon recognized it as Faramir's. Can he and his few remaining men be saved? Quote, at that moment, he caught a flash of white and silver coming from the north. Gandalf! Except Gandalf was obviously alone on Shadowfax since uh, Pippin was watching from the city walls. And there were far fewer men, not, uh, not a full company. This episode has been particularly hard to produce. The entire Gondor sequence here is almost impossible to follow. One sentence is only in the movie, the next is from the book, the, then one from both, but spoken by a different character in a different set of circumstances. Then one from four chapters previous. And then an entirely new scene. Next, one which will, will be said a little later. And finally, one from the movie that is edited to totally change the meaning of a scene in the book. Faramir makes it back to the city with Gandalf. And yes, he's startled to see Pippin. But no discussion ensues until uh, he's had a bite to eat and a drink in Denethor's chambers. Faramir's activities over the next ten pages or so are a bit of a mix and match. Some are actually shown, although modified, mainly by the addition of more people. And others are of the reported on afterward sort. And of course, a few are on film, but not on paper. Faramir gave his report on the collapse of the outer fortifications. This is how you would serve your city. You would risk its utter ruin. I did what I judged to be right. And only then does he mention that Pippin is... This is not the first halfling that I have seen walking out of Northern Legends into the Southlands without Gandalf asking. They then have much the same discussion as shown. You've seen Frodo and Sam? Where? When? In Athelion. Not two days ago. Gandalf, they're taking the road to the Mobile Vale.
then the pass of Kirithunga. Except Denethor was there, causing Faramir some discomfort. The first movie discussion between Faramir and Denethor also happens at this time. More or less. There is a lot added, mainly Gandalf and Denethor arguing about what should have been done with the ring. The exchange about wishing the sun's places had been exchanged is here instead of at the next I day's council meeting. Not a wizard, pupil, is here. Not some wizard, pupil. Bringing a mighty gift. his father's need. He would have brought me a kingly gift. In the hands sending of it with a witless halfling are here. I would not use the ring. Not if Minas Tirith were falling in ruin and I alone could save her. Faramir used these words when he rejected the ring way back in Chapter 5 of the Two Towers. There are a lot of changes. Now, the main difference is that Denethor sees Faramir is exhausted, physically and mentally, and sends him off for some rest, without further belittling him. Denethor is a slightly better person in the book. And he's he's portrayed more as a man with a tortured mind rather than an outright tyrant. Gandalf and Pippin return to their lodgings and have a discussion, which was replaced by the balcony scene in the movie. It covered different subjects, although it did include the Fool's Hope line. Just a fool's hope. The next day, quote, Faramir had gone forth again, unquote. We are then told of how that came about. Early that day, the council had been summoned. Apparently, this was the uh, high-level military leaders. There was discussion about the state of conditions around the kingdom. Denethor declared the river must be held. Is there a captain here who still has the courage to do his lord's will? Since you're robbed of Boromir, I will do what I can in his stead. If I should return, think better of me, Father. That will depend on the manner of your return. Your father loves you is here, not at the procession out the gate, which didn't happen. Do not throw away your life so rashly. Father loves you, Faramir. Bread before the end. Unfortunately, today's time has run out. Either I cut it here or, or wait another ten minutes, which would uh, be far too uncomfortable. At least we know how it's going to turn out, so we... Uh, don't need, really need to sit on the edge of our seats till the next time. But thanks for watching and you know, share, like, subscribe, etc. Like everyone else begs you to do.